Welcome to the Forge by Trust podcast. I'm your host, Robin Dreek, executive coach, former U.S. Marine, spy recruiter, and best-selling author, and your trust and communication expert. Today's episode, Uncommon Skills for Everyday Life, is brought to you by my guest, best-selling author, master interrogator, and behavior expert, Greg Hartley. Merging two careers to create a unique skill set combining human behavior with how business should work. Former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, elicitation instructor, and author of 10 books on body language and behavior. Effective operations and business transformation executive who is visionary, building high-performance teams and delivering results through action. Stellar knowledge of human behavior and expert in delivering messages through any platform. He's a proven communicator in front of the camera, in print, or in front of any audience, large or small. Check him and his offerings out at his website, greghartley.com. Coming up next on the Forge by Trust podcast. To be a good interrogator, you need to be able to feel what people feel. If you Absolutely. can't, it's just words. The biggest thing I think you got to do is to start to look at people from their angle. Very rarely do we use anything other than trust to get what we want. If you can stop thinking about people as they relate to you and start thinking of how they relate to other people from inside, you get a long ways with people. Welcome to the show. I'm Robin Dreek. And on the Forged by Trust podcast, we decode the interpersonal communication skills of the world's most acclaimed forgers of trust. We unlock the skills and techniques from spies, spy recruiters, master interrogators, globally recognized behavioral experts, C-suite executives, entrepreneurs, acclaimed authors, and thought leaders. Each episode provides specific actions that you can immediately apply to any aspect of your personal or professional life. Today's episode on common skills for everyday life is with my good friend, Patriot, and the acclaimed behavior panels, Greg Hartley. Greg Hartley combines deep expertise of how business works with equal expertise in how people work. Greg was an Arabic-speaking interrogator and deployed as interrogation and language support for Special Forces A-Team in Operation Desert Storm. As an instructor and subject matter expert for body language and behavior, Greg was recognized by the U.S. Army for his expertise and awarded the peer-granted Knowlton Award. Greg trained special operations soldiers to resist interrogation and worked as an anti-terror instructor as well as a principal protection instructor. Since leaving the U.S. Army, Greg has continued his career as a recognized body language and behavior expert, appearing in podcasts, radio and television, as well as in print. The author of 10 books on body language and human behavior, Greg has appeared on every major network. While maintaining his credentials in the human behavior field as an author and speaker, Greg has expanded his knowledge in human behavior to the corporate world through a stellar career as a business improvement executive and general manager. He has now turned his expertise in business to defining areas of weakness and his expertise in people to prevent deception in the process. During the episode today, we talk about SEER, survival, evasion, resistance, escape, interrogations, lessons learned, giving yourself permission to fail to be successful, and strategies to becoming a human behavior expert. Greg Hartley, it is a honor, pleasure, and exciting goosebumps going to have you on the show. Thank you for taking time because you are one of the busiest people I know in my entire life, no doubt. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. It's my honor to be here. I've been looking forward to this. Sorry it took so long. And so... As I start out all these conversations, I think of only one thing to try to understand the beautiful human being before me. And your life can be defined pretty simply, I think. You have been a man of service to others, whether it's our, your community, business, and the greater nation with all your service to our country. And thank you for that. What would you think, going back all those years when you were younger, what do you think was your spark that inspired you to want to serve others and discover these uncommon skills for everyday life? Well, thanks for using that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't know if I think all the way back to your youth, if you're trying to uncover all that. I, look, I grew up very, very poor. My parents were on no education, worked hard. They were good people. I grew up in a world where sometimes there was chaos around. And, and where'd you grow up? Georgia. Where, did you go to airborne school? I, I know where Fort Benning. Yes, I know where it yeah, is. Yeah, that's my hometown, and it's a lovely <laughs> little place. <laughs> nice. So I, I worked. My dad told. I'll, I'll, I'll ramble for a minute to give you my background. Please a little do. Bit. Yeah. So as far back as I can remember, my dad worked two jobs just trying to make it, and I can 
part of the reason I joined the army was not to have that pattern. Plus I saw a way to do something else and it became much more patriotic as a part of the army. But as early as I can remember, everyone around, around me worked really hard. They had two jobs. They had, you know, they did whatever it took to make it. And by that, I don't mean criminal activity, but like my dad would work all day in one shop and then go work on transmissions or engines in the evening. I learned to change oil when I was this tall, you know, so made me a car guy, as, as you know, I am. Right. But I, I watched all that and I watched how hard they worked and how much they put into whatever they were trying to do and how often they got very little return. So I knew I had to get an education. And that was really the genesis of me joining the army. I wanted more than anything. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I was a fan, you know, look, kids our age, my age, I wanted to be involved with space. Everybody did. Yep. I wanted to be a fighter <laughs> pilot. Didn't have the eyes, didn't have the, didn't have the money to go to college. I'm 60. And while now you can find fairly easily money, if you are smart enough to go to college, that was not the case in 1980. You know, the economy was different. So I joined the army to pay for college since I couldn't get a scholarship and go. I was probably not smart enough for that. Went on about my life. And in the army, I think is where I became much, much, much more patriotic than the day I joined. So when you joined the army, what did you join to do? Did you have any aspiration of MOS or anything? Yeah, here's the funny part. If I and you can't tell anybody this, I'm kidding. Of course, <laughs> I don't. I don't share very often that I started off as a unit clerk and doing that kind of stuff. But you know, you're in infantry, infantry battalions, and you see more. And then that was the beginning of it. It's just I was trying to pay for college, and in those days, you put a dollar in, and or you put two dollars in, they match one dollar, whatever it was. So I ended up with like eight thousand dollars to go to college. That goes a long way. But yeah, it, it, when I first joined, I actually signed up to be a chemical guy. Now, as weird as this is, the IThemos was fifty four Echo or something, right. and it was chemical protection. You know, all this I've got stuff still from that world. But it was nuclear, biological, and chemical. Right. And with some contract mess ups, I didn't end up doing it. I ended up in the unit doing something else. And in my last year of that hitch, I actually did do the NBC thing and enjoyed it, learned a lot about it. It was really complex. You know, you had to learn about downwind hazard predictions from missiles and, or from nukes and all. So it was cool. And then I left that and went off, of course, to language school. And when I went to language school, I had no idea. You know, I was not thinking interrogation. Or any of that. So okay, so there, there's so many things that are already saying, huh, that's interesting. First of all, how did you get to choose that? Yeah, and frankly, I went in and I had no idea what I wanted to do except for get the money and join the army. You know, I saw I'll back up again, all these poor people in my family. There are lots of soldiers really close by that didn't look quite so poor. Right. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? And I saw it as a way out. Right. Typically, I mean, I knew I did not want to live the rest of my life in Columbus, Georgia. I knew I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see more things. I, I have always, you know, I was in ROTC in high school, all that. I've always had that spark of patriotism. I just compared to where I got to, I don't think it was as strong as it is now. What made you want to see the world? You know, I, I think that comes from the intellectual curiosity that my grandmother instilled in me, my father instilled in me, and probably some just personality is just there. You know, just you want to see more, you want to do more. Your okay. grandmother? Yeah, my grandmother was, she lived in my house, you know, in, I, she died young, relatively like early seventies, but she in her youth had lived in DC. Now this is from, she's from deep South Georgia. She'd lived in DC for a few months. She was, my grandfather was an interesting kind of guy who just kept moving and that kind of thing. But my grandmother was not, she, they ended up splitting way back when in the thirties, when that didn't happen. Oh, wow. So she had lived in D.C. for a while, and her, my grandfather's father was like a security shift leader for the Smithsonian Institution. So she got to go in there at night, which is pretty cool for her. And when you hear all those stories, and Southerners are great storytellers, and you're sitting at the feet of people who are in World War II, and people who are in Korea, you know, all that, then you start to think, There's, the world's bigger than this. And so... I, I tell a story to people. My dad told me when I first moved back to Georgia at 38, I left at 18, came back at 38. He said, I remember you sitting in the car one time when you were five. And I remember when he's talking, he was welding on a wrought iron gate, repairing something for someone. Uh -huh. and, and he said, I was just sitting there looking and he came back and said, what are you thinking? And I said, I'm leaving here as soon as I'm old enough <laughs> at five. So I guess I always knew I wanted to go somewhere else. I just didn't know where somewhere else would be. 
Awesome. Yeah. What a great inspiration from your grandma. Yeah. She was, she was really good at instilling that. And then someone gave me a bunch of books, you know, and I was, I've always been a reader and that kind of thing. Less these days, I stay too busy to sit and read other than studies right. and that. But I read tons of anything I could get my hands on. And that creates another spark to want to go see that and yeah. do that. Sure. And then military families around you have been everywhere and they tell you about places. So that's probably where it all came from. Yeah, no doubt. Do you remember the first books that kind of sparked it? By chance? Yeah, I, <clears throat> my, my uncle, well, we moved in next door to a woman who had tons of encyclopedias. And I'm seven, eight in that age. Right. And these are old encyclopedias. I this is nice. 1969, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and, she, and she gave them all to me and I would sit and read through them and see things that I'd never seen, you know, so it just opened my mind to want to see more and do more in addition to all the stories. And there were science books in there, you know, around pressure and all Boyle's law and all that kind of stuff. So as a kid, I was still paying attention and learning that kind right. of stuff and making me want to learn more and see more and do more. So I guess that's where it came from. So now I'm getting to the really interesting part for that spark the other half of what you were saying so you start out in an nbc inside yep. the army and they send you to language school how the heck did that happen so, so it's even a more twisted story than that I, I did the nbc thing i ended up like i said doing unit clerk thing i was sitting in arlington doing that in uh -huh. the old guard and i'd go do ceremonies once in a while but my day job so you were part of the old guard doing the uh, at the tomb of the unknown soldier not at the tomb that's 10 people 12 people there are thousands right. of us in the cemetery. Marines have eighth and I, we have right. this and we have a presidential guard. We have the guys in the white wigs, right? We have the honor guard, all the drill team and all that. And then we have, you know, line units that do funerals. Yeah. How'd you get, that, how'd you get selected for that? Tall and thin. <laughs> all right. So you looked the part. Yeah. What else was going on? Do you think? Well, you know, anytime they come to recruit, I happen to know one of the guys who was recruiting from an earlier gig. And when they came to recruit, they're looking for, you know, clean record. You, you can't have run-ins with the law and all that kind of stuff. Right. You need to be 5'10 to 6'2 in those days were the, were the things. And you needed to be, wear a 30-inch belt. It didn't mean your waist had to be 30 inches. It meant you could compress whatever right. you had into <laughs> yeah, 30 Get inches. it into 30. <laughs> yeah. So th those were really the requirements. I think they had a GT score of 110, which is if those of you who are not familiar with the military, that's kind of a overall mental aptitude score. And I think right. it goes to like 155 or something, just to give right. you an idea. So they didn't want anyone there. They had to deal with a lot of problems from the law. They didn't want to have to deal with a lot of problems from other things. And it, I hate to say this out loud, but it is a pretty mindless job. The marching, you, you got to be really good physically at marching and saluting and movement. And you got to pay real close attention, but it's not rocket science. You're not standing right. around calculating. In fact, the day that I decided I wanted to do something different, I was doing cordon for a guy named McCaffrey, who was going to be chief of staff and died on the operating table. Oh, wow. And we, we set up a cordon through the cemetery where you stand at parade rest. And as the dignitaries come, you face about and salute. And I was there for hours. I was at the retirement for General Wickham and PX Kelly for hours. And I thought, this is a noble and don't take this as any way other than that. This is right. noble and important and comforts the families of heroes, but I don't want to do this. Right. And I carried a state and territory flag a few times. I did big ceremonies a few times and some funerals. And it just, it was an honor for two years. And that was enough for me. And how old were you at the time? About. I got there at 25 and left at 27. Okay. No, no. Yeah. 20. No, I got there at 23 and left at 25. So 1985 to 87 were my okay. years. Yeah. All right. So bring us up to the language school from there. Other yeah. Hand. So then I, again, pragmatic brain versus romantic brain. I have a balance of those. The romantic brain said, go learn a language, go do something fun and cool. What made you want to learn a language? That's, that's out there and it's challenging. There's no doubt. It goes back to wanting to see more of the world and go, if you speak the language, I'd lived in Korea already. I was in second ID for a while. And so I, I knew now I want to see more of the world because I've gone places. And when the opportunity came up to take, I took two tests. I took one for aptitude to be a power plant operator for the military. Right. And then I took the one for language and I thought I did well on both of them, you know, wow. high percentiles and said, 
what do I want to do? And I remember sitting and thinking, one will take me down a path that I'm going to be in a factory for the rest of my life. Be a good job because you'll be a power plant operator. You'll have a job somewhere. The other is going to take me places I can't imagine. Don't know. And I I took the test. They gave me four choices of languages and that was that. And so I jumped, I jumped overboard and took the language path. What language did you choose first? Arabic. And why? You know, I I lived in Korea and this now gets to the root of who I think I, if you ask me who I am, why is always the thing for me. Why, why people are like they are. And I'd lived in Korea. And I remember after a year and year and a half, I had good Korean friends, you know, locals because of, because of the Katusa program, I had roommates who were, you know, their parents were well, wealthy and that kind of thing. And the the travel program. Yeah. Sorry. Katusa is Korean augmentees to the U.S. Army. Okay. And every Korean male serves a couple of years in the military. So if your family has means or the ability to get you into that program, that's where you go. So really good friend, a guy named Lim Bong Su, who was a, who's now a, a journalist for one of the big papers, but was my roommate. And he took me around Korea, showed me around Korea, learned about Korea. And what I found is while culture certainly is different, it was easy enough to understand what their drives were. Drives were my drives. The, the Middle East is always, I think, for most people, one of the most mystical parts of the world. Right. Because there's, and anybody who tells me it's not mystical to them, I say, you don't understand how complex it is if you don't find it mystical. I don't right. mean like genies or that kind of mystical. I mean, wow. When you go there, it's just so astounding how complex the culture is. So I thought if I can learn a language, I can learn something about that. And so that was my driver, I guess. So for Arabic. Yeah. And I didn't want to be cold and I didn't want to be cold. (laughs) (laughs) Good good choice. So we're around 25, 27 years old at this point. You've been in the army a while. You've seen some things. You had really good roots in growing up. I can't imagine any of this happened without some humbling moments along the way that we learned a little bit about ourselves. What were some of the things you learned about yourself that you discovered? Well, yeah, I think you, unless you're, narcissistic or something's wrong with you, you, of course, realize, you know, I, I look, I joined the army. I could not run. I thought they were going to throw me out because I couldn't run. So I had to learn to run. I had to do all that. That was the first humbling moment. You know, you, I was always good at that kind of drill and ceremony stuff because of ROTC in high school and summer right. camp and all that. So that part was really easy for me. The humbling part was, well, now I got to be able to pass this test to get out. That was the first one. Right. So I had to become more physical. That was a good thing, in my opinion. It was one of my more formative moments in my life. And then, you know, anytime you're doing something, you're going to find something you don't do well. Most humbling was I got married young and divorced young. That's humbling. That was devastating because, I, you know, you made the biggest mistake of your life in one of the most important areas of your life. Wow. What did you learn so, from it? If you don't I think I learned, well, I learned... If you if you really dig into any divorce, it's expectations and entitlements, and not having clear understanding of those. And it's never one per. In my opinion, it's never one person. Right. It's a matter: of, did you get a contract right? You know, I do business all the time now, right. and bad contract equals bad outcome. And I think that's the case when you marry too young and too quickly, and that kind of thing. So it was a that was humbling. Like as far as like academic stuff, I was fine. That stuff was easy. Like Arabic was relatively easy for me. Wow. Um, interrogator school was interesting and challenging and fun. And then there's been some others. You know, we all have things we fail at and those pieces along the way. But yeah. What about leadership along this way? I mean, you have a really good, solid foundation of sounds like some good, healthy relationships. Were you learning anything about you as a leader? And, or is it just kind of came natural to be of service to others? You know, I think in terms of leadership, what I learned the most is by working for good and bad leaders, you know, good and bad leaders will get you all kinds of interest. Like I worked for guys when I was at Fort Benning. Oh, by the way, I joined the army to leave. My first assignment was Fort Benning. (laughs) (laughs) So, and there, I was probably the worst soldier on earth because I'm back in my hometown where all my friends are. Right. I'm hanging out with them and, you know, I'm not, I, I never got in trouble, but I was never a stellar performer. I was good at what I did. And I actually had a guy tell me many years later, you know, that your competence hides a multitude of sins. <laughs> I said, <laughs> well, thank God I have that. Because I, I've never been a guy who accepts 
that's how we do it as an answer. I think it's a dumb answer always. And it's how I made my career. So what I learned from good leaders was a handful of things. What I learned from bad leaders is a lot of things, like how not to treat people, how to be, you know, I deal with corporate people all the time. And I know narcissistic leaders. I know good leaders. But my best leadership lessons always came from the military. I mean, these guys some in civilian life, yeah, I mean, they do different things than we did. But a guy who is willing to put himself aside for the people that work for him is, is a leader. The other guys are managers, in my opinion. That's what I learned. Yeah. Innovation is a rare skill that people have the courage to execute. And normally the first time we execute our innovation, we hopefully do it in a safe environment. So we feel empowered to do it again. Do you remember the first time you innovated and what it was for? Yeah. Let me think back. You know, the army doesn't like innovation a whole lot. No, they don't. It's a rare skill to have that combination of the courage, self-courage and you to do it. And then to be recognized in a way that you'd be willing to do it again. Well, it, it, look, when I when I first became an instructor is probably the first time. I mean, when when I became an instructor, well, SEER, there's not a whole lot of room. SEER is all innovation. There's nothing scripted. That's the cool part of SEER. And for those listening, what's SEER school? Yeah, thanks. Survival, evasion, resistance, escape. I worked in the resistance lab where we put people through the paces as if they've been captured by enemy. Prisoners. How'd you get there? Yeah, another one of those, I always say I'm Forrest Gump. I'm lucky. I'm in the right place when the wind comes. I was in language school and I am it's pile, you know, pile, pile yeah. was sitting not far from me and we're all getting orders. Now this is before I finished my interrogator training. We're all getting orders and mine come in and say, Sear. And people are like, Holy, how'd you get that? That's the best job in the, in the country. It was a new organization. Sear was a couple of years old mm-hmm. and they had been renting. We called them rental interrogators. They've been renting interrogators from Fort Bragg and decided to hire 18 of us and create their own cadre. Oh. And I was one of the first 18 permanent party guys there. So it was Why a you? great opportunity. Somebody up there, you know, the- well, you know, you know, these are my favorite questions though. What did people see when they, so reverse the, they didn't even know me, they didn't even know me. They didn't even know me. I was in language school still. I'd not been through interrogator school. Here's my best guess. So when I was in Arlington, a friend of mine, a guy named Harry flood bird, Yeah, related to that, Harry Floodbird was in Uh the unit with me, and he had gone off to the Department of the Army. And when I decided I wanted to do language school, I got, there's a guy named Pasqualini who managed the entire language program, a lieutenant colonel. And this guy said, hey, I'll introduce you to him, and he'll give you some time. This guy literally said, come into my office, I'll give you the afternoon. And I sat in there, and he told me about every language slot in the entire U.S. Army, told me about interrogator, counterintelligence, <clears throat> interrogator, counterintelligence, voice intercept guys. And that's how I decided interrogator was the path I would take because I'm not meant for those other two. Right. You, you, you've been in CI your life. Tall redheaded people are not great in CI. <laughs> Although so I, it, it all comes continue. down to how you make people feel about themselves and you do a good job of that. So you would have excelled at that as well. <laughs> but you get made pretty quickly. You get burnt. That's you know? true. <laughs> Hard to blend in. <laughs> Did you go to language school to become an interrogator? Or that just came up along the way. So you had to choose when I chose Arabic, then you have to choose which MOS. And then you're at the mercy of the army after that. So I right. chose Arabic because I wanted Arabic. I chose, I chose interrogator because I couldn't see me being a CI guy. I have a really good friend I should introduce you to, to do the show. Okay. I'm named Max Duke, who's done everything in CI and all the way up to cyber and that kind of stuff. And he was a CI agent already and said, I can't see you being a great surveillance guy. I think you should. <laughs> and knew my personality and said, you should go be an interrogator. Right. So I, I took his advice, took the interrogator route, had no idea. When I first did it, I was a good linguist and thought that would be my strength. I'm a much better interrogator than linguist. So he said that you'll make a much better interrogator. What was he seeing that he thought would make you a good interrogator? Well, we'd known each other since we were 16, Uh maybe even younger. And he had been around me like retorting people and going at around their arguments and that kind of thing. And he's like, I think you got the talent to do this. So yeah, he was the guy who pushed me that way, actually. That's pretty cool. And so we get to Sears School. What was that experience like? So the, the most profound, if you're asking me about all my assignments, I would say it was the most profound assignment for a few reasons. Mm-hmm. Number one, you're now, everything you do is on you. I mean, everything you do. There's not a scripted anything. 
you're getting to use these skills you learned in interrogator school eight hours a day. How, how lucky is that? Yeah. It's a lot of reps. And you write the story that they are supposed to hide. So get, for, for those of you who don't know what SEER is about, we teach you how to resist interrogation. That's, you know, we won't talk about that because we right. don't want to compromise it. Right. Teach you how to resist interrogation, we teach you how to find food, how to hide, how to find water. <clears throat> and then we drop you off in the woods for a few days with a knife, a piece of rope and a canteen full of water and some iodine because you're going to get muddy water and you run, you have places you move from day to day to day and we chase you. And if we catch you, we move you back to yesterday's start point. So now you get 30 kilometers instead of 15 to move at night. And then we capture you and we put you through the mill for days and indeterminate number of days. And we interrogate you in the same way that our enemies would interrogate us. So you're doing that every day, but they have a story they're supposed to be hiding. That story, you know, we wrote it, we scripted it, we knew it. What better place is there to become a body language and behavior guy than me asking you questions that you're trying to lie to protect a story and me watching you lie all the time. It yeah, just was wow. a beautiful experience. Some of my lifelong friends came from there. Yeah. And one of the best, best bosses I ever had was a civilian. Wish I could get him to come on here for you. A guy they call the bearded one that the SF guys one. would tremble in his shadow. Big guy, Don Landrum, brilliant, not school trained interrogator, Green Beret guy. And the single best at getting through to people of anyone I ever met. So great. So great never even never on. even formally trained. Where do you think he got his skill set from to be able to do that? We was in Vietnam for a while. You know, he was a Green Beret in Vietnam back in the day. He's one right. of the original guys. And then he came and he was training these guys, teaching interrogate or teaching resistance. You you have to learn what the techniques are. But it was more than that. What I think he opened my eyes to was we can use these 14 approaches or we can get to the root of who people are. Right. And he wouldn't tell you it's Maslow, but I would tell you what he was masterful at is slicing you off from your group and creating a new normal where you felt like you needed to appeal to him. And that's what we all do. It's just yeah. that we don't, we can't all put it in those words, but that's what all of us are doing in this world. So what was the greatest thing you think you learned going through Sears school besides the experience of having those incredible repetitions, as I call them, reps. Yep. What what did you take away from that? Going going through it, look, there's nothing as sucky as captivity. Let's just face that. Right. And when we were captured, I can still remember, I just get, look, I'm pretty contained, but if you slap me in the face, I can get pretty angry. <laughs> I <bet. laughs> and I got pretty angry and controlling that. What I learned about myself is as much as I love people, because I do, I mean, my wife will tell you, I talk to everybody on earth, but as much as I love people, I don't love people when they're in those situations and they're trying to figure out and, and restabilize, they'll do some pretty bad things to each other. Mm. And so what I found is that I have a lot of strength while I'm very extroverted. I have a lot of strength if I can recollect and get away and, and, and stand on my own. But when I was in a room with 10 people who are talking and their microphones everywhere, I'm like, don't be stupid. Shut You know, you want to help them. And sometimes you can help people in spite of yourself. So I think I learned that that personality type in me that wanted to help people, you can't help everybody. You just got to back away. That was pretty powerful for me. Well, that's a really good, good point. How many interviews and interrogations do you think you did while you were there? Rough guess. Oh, hundreds, a few hundred, 800 to a thousand, something like that. Yeah. That'd how many years guess. were you there for in that assignment? Oh, four, four. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot yeah. of reps. One strip search, you know, we look, we did takedowns. We did uh, one of my favorites ever. We were doing a class of civilians and I'll tell you sometime where they work, but yeah, we were, we were doing a driving demonstration because I wrecked cars for a summer. We I helped create the <laughs> principal protection instructor course. Right. I got lots of opportunities there that I would have never gotten just being an interrogator. And we had these guys there and I was the bad guy. We were doing this was an Arabic scenario, Arabic speaking scenario. And I had to wear gargoyles and <laughs> balaclava and all that. So they couldn't tell right. what I look like, had gloves on. And I still remember I walked around the corner and we had this three-sided shelter and we were doing a driving demonstration. They were all excited. And I grabbed this guy by the hair and put a gun in his face. And he just went and passed out. And I was like, are you sure you're in the right business? Is my first thought. <laughs> but so we did that. We got to learn about abduction. We got to learn about, you know, we stripped every week. We strip searched people, took them down, all, learned all those skills that you need to be a Ford deployed interrogator. 
so that when the war broke out and I actually went to war, it was second nature. Those are right. things I'm doing every day. Just nobody's shooting. So, right. What was your, your weakest point you think you went in with? And what do you think you mastered by the time you left? Well, I think when you go in there, you have no idea what to expect. You don't. I mean, you think, okay, I'm going to go here and I'm going to go through the paces and I'm going to just play this game because we look, we have certain things we have to do that are prescribed. There's the whole process of interrogation. There's the getting through the interrogation and getting the person to be able to recognize what you're doing. So if I, if you can't recognize it, I have to be pretty heavy handed in my approach because they're taught the approaches before they show up. Good example, something we call good cop, bad cop, something they call threat and rescue. Anybody can recognize that. Mm -hmm. What you can't recognize often is futility and that play on you're going to lose. It's just a matter of how long it takes you to lose. So the mechanics of that and learning to be nuanced at the right time with the smart guy and not so nuanced at the time with the other guy, I think is what I developed from there in a way that even in interrogation or in my business life, all those things, I've gotten a lot of strength from that in a way I would not have ever had when I first went there. And I was a pretty smart kid, but smart doesn't translate to people skills in the way we use them. Right. What was the best people skill you learned from that? That's a good question. Hmm. I'd have to think back really hard, you know, I, making you shake that brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I think probably the, the, the hardest thing I learned was everybody's smart in some way. Everybody's smart in some way. And, and even the dumbest guy you meet, if you can get to the root of what makes that guy get up in the morning, there's something, there's something right. you don't know. And it probably drove a lot of this for me to want to talk to people more and right. find out what they know I don't know. Right. So it <clears throat> sounds like empathy was it? Maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe that's it. And I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I will tell people for all the stoic nature I have on the show, I probably feel people's pain more than they realize. And I used to say that to people, to be a good interrogator, you need to be able to feel what people feel. If you absolutely. can't, it's just words. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be able to make that connection. No doubt. So we have these mad skills after years of reps of doing this. What was next? Yeah, you know, it's I, I left. I took a job in Kuwait working for a contractor. This is right, right after so, the war. So you left the army right from being in For a year. For a year. Yeah. Oh, for a year. Okay. So so I went, I went to the Gulf War. I went to the Gulf War and I worked with Fifth Group. I was with a team. I was assigned to a, an ODA and I went north into What's an Kuwait ODA City. for everyone? Oh, yeah, yeah. The operational Detachment Alpha, an A team. Everybody okay. knows that term. So I got assigned to this team and that was a great learning experience. I actually got to interrogate enemy prisoners in real time, actually grab some was actually with three Anglicos. You'll know what those are. Yeah. Those are guys who direct fire for ships to ground. I was with three Anglicos and we captured 20 Iraqi prisoners together who were armed still at the time. Wow. And I was screaming at them in Arabic, put your weapons down. They're screaming back. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Don't really intense few minutes. Wow. Learned from that a whole lot. I got lots of experience there that changed the way my brain works. I'm certain there yeah. was that. And there was a road checkpoint and a handful of other things but worked with this A team and learned a whole lot more about real life. I mean, about prisoner handling up front. It's different than being in a cage, as you yeah. can imagine. Yeah. And then we went into the city. I'm only telling you this story to give you the next leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we went into the city, into an area called Hawale El Nagra, which was our area to cover. We get in the city and we had prisoners bypassed and a whole bunch of other op options. The day that made me believe body language works, we were pulling people out of buildings. And I'll, I'll tell you sometime offline this story because it's a long one. But there's a guy and I was cutting people loose and saying, this guy can go, this guy can stay because I'm the only interrogator in the group and the, the guy who speaks Arabic. And we were picking guys and there's a guy that everything about him just hit me wrong. After many, many notes and three years of interrogation at SEER and paying attention to patterns, all his patterns were wrong. Wow. And- I'm comparing him to other Arabs too, not right. just Americans. And I put him on a truck and sent him south. And later the guy said, how'd you know he was on the bad guy list? And I said, I didn't. That's when body language started to be a thing for he me. He knew. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> he knew he was on a bad guy list. And so yep. he was deviating. <laughs> yep, exactly. So his baseline was all jacked up. But anyway, I, I left that and there was a guy, I won't give his name, but who connected with me and said, hey, I need somebody to be an administrator for demining program in Kuwait. I'll let you go from there. Sure. And I, I took the job, got a contract, got a little bonus, signed, left the army. How old were you at the time? 
29. And 29. still single? Single again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I am. Um, so I, I was 29. I took that job. I went home to be with my family before I went away to Kuwait for an indeterminate amount of time. And while I'm at my parents' house, I get a call. Hey, we lost our contract. And it's the Middle East. In those days, there was a lot of how you go to go about business it was a little different than today. Sure. And we lost our contract and I got stuck in Columbus, Georgia again. So <laughs> 1992 was a long year. Then I went back in the army. <laughs> right. So did you get, how'd you go back in? Did you get to go to back to the same job you had? It's funny. I first went into the reserve program in that year and I went into a, a non-qualified Green Beret medic program, meaning you're getting ready to go off to SFAS, which is selection and assessment where you go through and they decide if you're worthy of going to school. And then if you're worthy, they send you off to school as a medic. Yeah, that was what I wanted to do. Why that? Well, I'm a horse guy and I had great medic friends my whole time, had roommates who were medics when I was at Bragg. And these guys were masterful at dealing with veterinary issues. And and there's the whole people side of it. You know, I I like helping people, but the the medical side of it for me, like I, I learned from those guys to stitch, I guess, stitch up the injuries to do IVs. And that's been invaluable with horses it just has. So I when thought were you a horse guy. I missed that. I, I, I'm still a horse guy. I've had horses since I was 20, 23. Yeah. What got you into horses? A, ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> I often say it was a good trade. <laughs> So yeah, so I've got a barn full of horses now. I live on on acreage. I've got one at the vet right now. That, that's probably who was just buzzing me. Sorry for yeah. that, but yeah, you got horses and cars, man. That's the perfect balance of life, right there. <laughs> well, that's a, that's the a perfect balance for no money. That's what I would say. To people. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> both both you pour money into the hole in the ground. All right, but so we yes. get back in. Yes, yeah, so I went back in. I I went there in that reserve program, and then they moved to the guard, and I was like, hey, done with that. And then I went back into being a platoon sergeant as a reservist for, for Intel. I had a bunch of, a whole platoon full of interrogators, young guys, some really good ones, some guys who didn't know what they're doing because they're just reservists who have been through school and came back and never had a reason to use it. Sure. So I tried to start building training for them and then started doing missions, active duty for special work missions for a place called the Northeast Day Risk up in New Jersey and kind of became their go-to guy for interrogation wrote a ton of big interrogation exercises, ran multinational. I mean, I was the driver doing, building the exercise, driving the exercise. How'd you get this position? How'd you get that spot? Well, really another weird kind of thing, Forrest Gump again. I happened to, they had this program manager role. They were looking to build a remote language training program for people who live in Wyoming and Montana and Utah that, you know, they can't get to a reserve center. They can't get to these places. So I got tapped. I went in, took this active duty for special work tour for six months, designed a program working with local universities to get them credentialed to teach these guys what we needed them to teach. And they would, you know, record all their time, do everything that you needed for reserve program and set that program up. And the guys liked my work so much that next time a contract came up, they're like, Hey, Hey, we'd love to have you back for this. We know your interrogation skills are stronger than your project management skills even. So I went back. And there was an, a, an exercise called Goal Sword that it, the idea was there, but it wasn't. And I started scripting that day and created a whole bunch of scenario, took the, the scenario they built, which was kind of not real world. In those days, we were using fictional players. Sure. I used real world players for the first time, started mm-hmm. looking at order of battle, meaning what kind of equipment and troops and everything else they have, and used real data in this thing. And scripted lots of roles. And I always said, it really is like writing a novel. You're writing a war story in 60 pieces that interrogators have to go in and get, pull that data, feed it to the analyst who are looking at interrogation and satellite and, and, and to get to an end story. And the first time I did it, it was a lot of fun. So I kept coming back and working on that. They created a position for me there. And I spent my last three years in the army as a full-time instructor there running these big exercises. These exercises were multinational. We had, we had Australians, Canadian, occasionally Canadians, Brits, Germans, Danes, Dutch, and all these guys would come over and it was joint force and multi-component. So we had air force, Marines, Navy, army, national guard reserves, all there. The biggest one had a hundred and I think it was 120 interrogators. 
which is massive. If you don't know, that's theater level interrogation assets. Mm -hmm. And 220, 230 people who spoke foreign languages as role players. So it was all done in language. Oh my gosh. And we created systems for tracking how effective the interrogators were and databases for tracking what they were pulling so we could focus on. How do you track how effective an interrogator is? Yeah, so we, we trained, first of all, all the role players had to go through an academy to learn how to role play. And what we meant by that is you need to know what interrogation looks like. You need to right. know whether they're hitting that. So they'd have an index card. And on that index card, it would say, what was the approach used? And they would write in the approach. What was effective? What did they try first? We had elements of data that were available in that day or in that interrogation. So for example, let's say there's nine elements of information. They would tell you how they exploited it and how much. We put that in a database and we could track how a person was doing against a given kind of source. And what that allowed us to do, because this is two week long exercise, it allowed us to focus. And one of the best parts was we had... 800th MP, which is the biggest MP organization in the world, there to actually do the prisoner handling. So we were working real life before the Gulf War, before the next war ever broke right. out. But in that process, we could then tell which interrogator was weaker and hand them a source that would not be as hard to break. So they could grow in the process and then hand that report back to their commanders. So they knew where they're focused, where they need to focus their training. That is remarkable. The thing that pops in my head. Yeah, the thing that really pops in my mind, I'm curious about, did you see a trend of what people generally had as a great challenge in this? Well, yeah, the hardest part for interrogators, look, we train guys, again, you go back now to language school, right? You train guys who want to learn a language, and they fall in love with the culture. They just fall in love with the culture because they're taught by natives right. who have migrated to the US. And then you ask them to go and be just hard nosed with people from the culture they're in love with. Right. That's the hardest thing, I think. And a lot of these kids have no life experience. If tomorrow I were redesigning the interrogation program, you'd wander in there about 25 to 30 years old. 25 would be the earliest. 18 right out of high school, what experience do you have? Yeah. Yeah, you know how hard it is talking to somebody who's 40 when you're 18. Right. I mean, you've done some of the same stuff. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. All right, so we did this. We got mad skills at this point. What do we do next? You know, I did that until I, I actually went to law school for about a year and thought, I don't want to do this. <laughs> you are a renaissance man of human behavior. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I knew that I had to find, because I'd gotten out and gotten stuck once. Right. You know, that was humbling because it taught me, you may think you're smart, but the system works a certain way and you need to figure out how that system works to right. get, if you want a job. Right. And part of the reason that I have been successful outside now and I was not then is I did never got the degree, never did get the degree. And so I had all these credentials from behavior and body language and, you know, I had done bodyguard stuff, all this stuff. And even applying for a security guard, a security guard job, it was you got a lot of experience, but no education, that kind of thing, if you're trying to run it. So I thought, okay, I got to go back and get a degree. And I did while I was at Fort, at Fort Dix, that last assignment. I spent as much time as I could, got the degree finished. And that helped me to start thinking of what's next. The last year I started thinking, okay, you can take a chance and just get out and do something or you can prepare. You need to prepare. Now that degree that I'd gotten, I thought, I don't know how well that's going to be received. You know, I've done it piecemeal here and here all across years. How do people going to look at that? And I'm right. 38, not 22. Right. So I started law school because I could. I got into Rutgers right there in, in New Jersey. Right. Went to law school for a year, really realized early, this is not what I want to do with my life, really. And then the worst thing they could possibly do is let you talk to first year guys who had graduated and they're all doing papers. Not right. for me. Again, back to <laughs> So I, I, I made myself a plan and I thought, now I'm at 18 years in the reserves, 15 years active. And I made a plan and said, if I can make enough money in my first year to pay my normal army pay, plus what I would get in retirement, I'll leave the army because I'm young enough still to have a plan and get somewhere down the road. Right. So I did. I went, found a job as a construction manager in Atlanta, building public schools, hospitals, and jails, all lowest bitter stuff. And that took me down the path I'm in now. And oddly enough, that's the reason I wrote my first book, believe it or not. Why? So they had this thing called project management war games, which I found amusing. I was building public schools and it was July. And so in July, that is the busiest month you possibly have. 
Right. And the guy that I worked for thought, Hey, I'll make myself look really good in the company. I'm going to send this guy. So he'll look, he'll make me look good as a project manager. So I was doing well. I show up there and I'm so irritated because my phone in those days, as I had direct connect would click every 30 right, seconds. Right. Right. I remember those. Right. Oh my God. They were awful. Every time it would click, you just, your blood pressure would rise. Cause you know, it's a problem. And they sent me this training in the middle of my busiest possible thing. And I was so irritated that I just said, taking my gloves off, I'm going to treat these guys like prisoners. And I just manipulated my <laughs> way through the whole thing. <laughs> and I won. I won the, the thing. There were like 50 of us there, and I won. And it, my team won. There were three of us. And the, the woman said, I felt like I was eating out of your hand for some reason. I said, because I'm using dirty tricks. It's just, <laughs> I'll just tell you, I'm using dirty tricks. And the guy who was running it is a guy named Michael Dobson, who's there in D.C., really uh -huh. smart guy, project management expert, built Air and Space Museum, really, he's written a ton of books. And he came over and he said, whatever you're doing, you got to write a book. And I said, don't have time to learn to write a book. That looks like work. I'm busy. I got a day job. I got horses. In those days, I was doing theater at night and a whole ton of other stuff. What are you and doing I just in said, theater? I, I, stage, stage stuff. It Why? was all community. Yeah. It's fun. I learned something from it. What did you learn Did it from? for about five presentation skills, even better. You get in front of people, you're better, sure. you more presence, that kind of thing. That's great. So it was fun. I learned something from it and had a great time. Good people. When I was in Jersey and doing it, there were a ton of good people there. And then I moved to Georgia, did one show and it was done. But he got me to write the book. And he, what he told me was, you're just doing a $10 calling card. Just remember that. It's probably going to be your own. with everyone the name of the first book. How to Spot a Liar is the one right there. There you go. But yeah, so it brought, that's what brought me to books. I got lucky there. And so the rest is kind of just followed along. So Greg, share with us all through these amazing life experiences, a few uncommon skills for everyday life. Yeah. The, the biggest thing I think you got to do is to start to look at people from their angle. The biggest, you know, I'm not going to give you all my little things, but I will, sure. what I will tell you is to learn to look at people from their eyes, from inside. And that's really everything you do, Robin, everything we all do, all the people you're talking to, it's all about motivation. It's all about getting that person to feel like they want to do. Very rarely do we use anything other than trust to get what we want. Because if you're using Lena, just, I know, you know, Lena really well. Yeah. I just wrote a little piece for her book. And what I said was Lena's dead on trust is everything. I look, I've been the bad guy more than one time in interrogation because I look the part, I scream and yell and pound the table <laughs> just so that you can win with the person. Cause they don't want to talk to me. Right. If you can stop thinking about people as they relate to you and start thinking of how they relate to other people from inside, you get a long ways with people. It's just, I do it in corporate America. You, you're going to have reasons where you get into conflict with people. If you can stop and look back and try to think about why the conflict occurred from their point of view, you're probably going to win more, more often in the, in the argument or, or you'll just stop arguing one of the two. What's the first thing someone can do to see the world from someone else's optic, do you think? You know, I think, listen, listen to keywords. I'm, I'm a big fan of listening. I got big ears. I'm a big fan of listening first. And then paying attention to what they're saying, because people stress the words that matter to them. And they use word patterns. They use word patterns that indicate this, this is important. That isn't. And a lot of times on the show, on the behavior panel, you'll hear me say, I, I heard this. Right. The body language is important, but body language can't tell you what voice tone can tell you. you on a phone, you can hear somebody. Right. And I usually say, I listen for pitch, tone, cadence. And pitch is how, you know, how, how, yeah, yeah, yeah. how your voice rises from stress right. tone. We all know tone because everybody can, if I say it's not what you said, it's how you said it. Everybody knows that. And then cadence. I talk fast for a Southern boy. Right. A lot of people talk slow. Alex Murdo. Right. Real slow talking, low country guy. Oh, you do that really well. <laughs> well I'm, I'm from here. Remember? <laughs> but if he speeds up, it means something. If I slow down, it means something. And you've heard it during here when you ask me tough questions and I slow down to think. Right. So, Greg, what else didn't I ask you that I should have asked you about <laughs> uncommon behaviors? You know, I, I think the biggest thing that most people assume is that we have some mystical voodoo power. 
Mm-hmm. Nothing mystical about anything we do. What you do, what I do, what the behavior panel does, it is really mundane repetition. And you said it reps. If you do it enough times, <clears throat> it becomes second nature. And that's good or bad stuff. Right. If a person's doing bad things often enough, that becomes second nature. And, you know, pl- I always say everything we know today, we've always known about people. There's nothing new. Right. And w- there are lots of adages and proverbs and cultures that tell you that, like eyes of the mirror, windows of the soul, that kind of stuff. So give yourself permission and give yourself permission to look and to use these skills. But as importantly, give yourself permission to fail because you're going to fail. You're going to be wrong and be wrong. It's okay. If you're never wrong, then you're not growing. You're not learning. Just be careful how you condemn people with it. But if you're, if you fail, you'll learn from that more than you will by being right every time by far. So where should someone go and what should they do to start getting some reps? We've got a lot of people in our audience that are like your audience, massively into human behavior. They're into body language or into just understanding the human condition in general. What can they do to get reps in? Yeah. And what I love about what you're doing, Robin, is you're bringing people from lots of different places. I mean, all the experts you bring in and you, look, there are lots of ways to be an expert in what we're talking about in behavior, which is what I love the most about what we do. I would say pick one thing. And there's an old saying, if you get good at one thing, you'll miss all the rest. I'm not saying get one thing and do it for the rest of your life, but do one thing until it's second nature. One thing. That's good. And I, I use a very simple method, I, emblematic gestures. That's, I, I say there are five real pieces of body language you need to learn to pay attention to mm-hmm. and look for change. And those are emblematic gestures. So G, and that means I hold a thumb up and everybody knows what it means or an okay sign, which God knows what it means these days right. <laughs> <laughs> or any, anything else. It can be anything, but it has to be universally understood. And every receiver has to understand what you're saying. It's a thought within a movement. I like it. Easy enough. Gesture, emblematic gesture. Illustrators. Everybody knows what this is. I'm driving home my point. That's an illustrator. And for me, that's a simple way to look. It can be that. It can be this. <clears throat> it can be my face. It can be anything that drives home punctuation to my thoughts. So gestures, illustrators. The next I'll cover is regulators. And I use this middle finger because it'll stop a conversation. Right. And that's what a regulator does is control the conversation. Speed up, slow down, stop enough. Those, all those things are discernible. You can pay attention. Some of them are cultural, you know, Middle East, I wouldn't do this, right? That kind of thing, but depends on where you're at, but they're all cultural, suppressing, con- controlling conversation. So gestures, illustrators, regulators, adapters. I use the ring finger because an adapter is a comforting move or a lo- yeah, loss of nervous move. energy move. Yeah. Right. And there's tons of them. And if you are, are in a relationship and you don't know yours, ask the other person. In the <laughs> they know. Yep. Yeah. Cause you do it all the time. So it's easy to remember if you got a ring. So I always say gestures, illustrators, regulators, adapters, and finally barriers. And if I put my hands both in front of me, that's giving me space. And then there's a lot to learn past that. I may illustrate from that space. Right. But I want you to get in your head, those five pieces. If you can, now you got a pattern. I'm a mnemonic device guy. I'm sure you can tell. Yeah. But you got a pattern to carry around. And what I would tell you to do is to pick one. Doesn't matter which one. Put it on an index card, put it in your pocket, put it on your phone, put it in your pocket. And for a day, five days, two years, however long it takes you, pay attention and be able to classify those. Don't try to understand what they mean at all. Right. It's not important. Just observe. And when you get to the point where they're second nature, you'll go, why did he move his left eye that way? Now you got, that is a second nature thing. Now you're looking for deviation from baseline. And if you can do that, everything will start to fall together for you because you're starting to see change in pattern. And that's all we do. It's boring. It's, it's mundane. It's repetition. It's repetition. It's repetition. And it takes time and reps and effort. Yep. Greg, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. So where can people go to find out more about Greg Harley, the behavior panel and put you into their lives more? Yeah. Just come to readbodylanguage.com is the easiest. That goes right to my, my webpage. And I link back to the behavior panel. I link back to the body language tactics and behavior, all the things that we have out there. And there's some free stuff out there. You can go click and you'll get a link to free stuff and get a, a short lesson, that kind of thing. 
Excellent. All and all in the show notes, folks. Greg, I can't thank you enough for taking us on a journey of understanding where your amazing mad skills and reps came from. And again, I thank you for your service from before to now, because you are con- constantly providing a great insight and service to humanity. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Robin, thank you for all the things you do and for your service. Long years in, in more than one place. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Forge by Trust. Remember, if you want to forge trust, it's not how you make people feel about you that matters. It's how you make them feel about themselves. If you're interested in more information about how I can help you forge your own trust building, communication, and interpersonal strategies as your coach or as a trusted advisor for your organization, please visit my website at www.peopleformula.com. I'm looking forward to sharing my next Forge by Trust episode with you next week when we chat with Jim Pyle and the Conversation Codex.